It was almost like a movie scene. Except he he didn't embellish. He just said, well, I hit the guy and he fell. And then his friends would say, what did you just do? What did you hit him with? My fist. Hello, everyone. It's episode 106 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Mr. Alex Gillis. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best martial arts podcast. I'd like to personally welcome you. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm Whistlekick's founder, but I'm also blessed to be your host for Martial Arts Radio. Thank you to the returning listeners, and hello and welcome to those of you listening for the first time. If you're new to the show or you're just not familiar with what we make, try checking out our hats. We've got different styles of both baseball caps and winter beanies. Basically, if you're looking for something to cover your head, we have an option. You can find all of our hats at whistlecake.com. If you're interested in our sparring gear, which is really the heart of what we make, you can find that there too or over at Amazon. If you want the show notes, including links and photos, you can find those at whistlecakemartialartsradio.com. Now, if you're not on the newsletter list, now is really a great time. We send out exclusive content, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. And hey, sometimes we even mail out a coupon. Over the course of this show, we've had a lot of different answers when we ask our guests about their favorite movies and actors. But when it comes to martial arts books, there are only a few we've heard of consistently. Joe Hyam's Zen in the Martial Arts, Miyamoto Musashi's The Book of Five Rings, and Alex Gillis's A Killing Art. The first two authors have passed away. Of course, Musashi has been gone for quite a long time, but Mr. Gillis is alive and well, so we invited him to come on the show. You can learn a lot about Mr. Gillis from the way he wrote the book, and you can learn a lot about the book from our conversation with the man. Thoughtful, thorough, and dedicated are words that you can use to describe either. Let's welcome him to the show. Mr. Gillis, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hello. Well, it's a joy to have you on, and... Listeners may not recognize you by name. Some of them might, uh, but quite a few of them are going to recognize you by your major work, if if we may call it that, uh, the book of Killing Art, which has been mentioned on the show quite a few times. So it's going to be fun to hear some kind of behind the scenes stuff. I'm sure as we go through, we'll get some pieces and we'll talk more about the book towards the end. But um, just as we do with everyone that comes on the show. Let's talk about how you got started in the martial arts. Where you know, give us some of the the how, when, and why kind of stuff there. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. Um, I started about thirty five years ago in Ottawa, in Canada, in Taekwondo, and I trained as a teenager with a pioneer named Park Jung Tech, and soon also um, a man named Fap Lu from Vietnam became my instructor. So. Yeah, it was Taekwondo. It was a traditional style, which was the non-Olympic type of Taekwondo. And right away, I got into the physicality of it, the athleticism, and a bit of the politics, because Mr. Park, Master Park at the time, was a pioneer. He's one of he's part of the first wave of Koreans who started Taekwondo. Okay. So, what was it about? martial arts that kind of drew you in well as a teenager i mean i would i just fell in love with the the acrobatics of it, the athleticism i guess the power and speed of the movements um i guess unconsciously too the transference into psychological and emotional states so you know i, I lived near the dojo near the gym and after high school, I'd walk up the street to this, you know, I think it was first or second floor gym, and um, just worked my butt off, just trained very hard, met a lot of good people. The martial artists and the level of, of training was astounding. I mean, there was one class where an instructor, I'll never forget it, he had us jog along the canal. Ottawa has a beautiful canal. And longest in the world still. And we jogged a good five kilometers at a, quite a pace, came back, and the class started at that point. I was only 16, 17 at the time. 
And we could barely lift our legs and arms, but he put us through our paces for an hour and a half. And that was not the norm. That was an exceptional class, but it was expected that you were to do things like that occasionally. And I love that about Taekwondo too, maybe all martial arts, that although you're not training at explosive speeds and maximum power, you're training to be able to attain almost superhuman levels of flexibility and execution of power, intention of motion. It's a really unique sport or practice. And I, I love that as a teenager, very active. I love the whole thing. Mm. I think you're describing that same appeal that a lot of us have felt for the martial arts that I, I like the way you put it uh, in terms of being superhuman, you know, pushing those boundaries of, of physicality and what you're able to do. And while I never had a run along the canal before a class, you know, certainly have trained with a number of instructors who kept us guessing as to maybe what the warm up would be or, or just different elements of class. And I think there's yeah. a push there mentally, you know, not just, just driving you in terms of physical practice, but mental practice. Yeah, yeah, and and perhaps you also know that the feeling of seeing how physical training can be transferred to emotional or psychological states or even relationships. Like just a small example, a lot of a lot of people are used to everyday tensions and conflicts, especially in workplaces. An example would be um, if someone stands too close to you, like say a colleague or either a stranger, mm -hmm. and it, we know what our we know what makes us comfortable depending on our our cultural background, but the a training training in the martial arts makes you acutely aware of your surroundings, what people's intentions might be, not just how how close they're standing to, you, but what they might do in that space. And I found as a youngster when I was training that very quickly I could transfer the physical stuff to realizing oh. This person's standing very close to me, and he's not aggressive or anything in his workplace, you know. But I'm actually not scared. I, I, I would know if something happened, what I would do. And so I think a lot of, maybe a lot of us underestimate that the tensions and the way we avoid conflicts and um, the way we get used to unspoken, I guess, violences, I would put it. Um, or intentions to do something or say something. A lot of it is verbal or emotional. But I think at a very young age, I realized, wow, martial arts are good for me, and it's more than just a physical thing. Sure, sure, absolutely. So that gives us a pretty good intro, some context for who you are. Now, of course, I'm sure you've had a lot of experiences that could translate into some great stories, just as I read through your book, just the people that you've met, right? As you were doing that research, I'm sure there was some incredible experiences. But rather than pin you down, I'll let you pick one of your own. If I was to force you, your hand and say, what's your best martial arts story? How about we hear that? Best martial arts story. Um, when I was writing the book, I came upon many, many anecdotes and many interviewees who told me, astounding stories about about Taekwondo's history. And some I couldn't believe. As a journalist, I corroborated them and included those that were true. I mean, it, it came on one point where I discovered people I idolized, like General Hong Hee Choi, who named Taekwondo, uh, Jun Rhee, who's called the father of Taekwondo, a couple of martial arts Hollywood stars, whose names ended in Rhee. Their dad was involved with the Korean CIA. All these men, the older men, were involved in shenanigans and some really violent uh, espionage missions and other situations. And as I got deeper into a couple of the anecdotes, in particular, the ones involving uh, Jun Ri and, and General Hong Hee Choi, I got in these emotional states of, uh, I guess, not just disappointment and why am I doing this martial art, but also terror because... Their disciples, family members, and others were still alive. And here I was writing the truth about some of the shenanigans and worse that they'd been involved in. So there was one day where 
this bloody book I was writing, A Killing Art, had to be done. I had to get it off to the publisher. And so I realized I wasn't going to be able to do it because I basically hated my martial art because of the darker parts of this history. And I got in a car and drove into the Ontario backwoods, went to a cottage. And this is why martial arts training is good. You can, I think, a lot of us, we can do this if you have some self-awareness. I just hold up for a week with these extremely dark thoughts and emotional states and the material. And I listened to the taped interviews with Jun Ri. I went through the dilemmas, the legal issues, the ethical issues, what was fair, what wasn't, what would I leave in the book, what would I take out. There were stories of not Jun Ri, but other men who had beaten up their family members with baseball bats. These were world leaders in Taekwondo. And there were situations like that. What in that case, the baseball bat scene, I did not include that in the book. And so that week in in the woods. In this, in this cottage, I, I really struggled and finished uh, an entire two chapters. I remember that. And um, it's a martial arts story, I think. It's not a street fight. It's not a big competition where I got a gold or anything like that. It's a good example how, of how martial arts training uh, can help you get through a tough time. As you were starting to talk about that, I could hear, you know, a little bit of a quality in your voice of of that, an expression of that disappointment, the the fall from grace of some of these people that, you know, you had looked up to. I don't know if I want to use the word idolize because it's a pretty strong word, but I think you know where I'm going. And I felt some of the same elements as I read through your book, and I'm glad because I almost felt guilty in feeling that. And so it makes me feel even better that the creator of the book, the one who brought these stories to us, to me, had some of that same conflict. Is that a theme that's popped up for you more? I mean, have, have you reconciled that differently now? How do you, how do you view I have, yeah. that, I guess? Okay, I think you know what I'm trying to ask. might not be doing the best job of it. I have reconciled it. I mean, I realized when I first started Taekwondo, I looked up to the men who had started it, some of whom lived in Toronto. One of them, Park Jung Su, was my was a pioneer instructor. He helped start Taekwondo. He lived in Toronto. I looked up to them, and in, in a wrong way, I was young. And the the organization is certainly this part of the continent. Well, I can actually could generalize in, in a lot of North America and the world. Taekwondo, the organizations were run like a cult. And so they were cultish, certainly. And so I looked up to these men in a in not too mature way. You know, I was young. And as I developed, I realized and I saw, and as I was writing the book, of course, they're human. They made mistakes, they have weaknesses. General Choi, in particular, but also many of his pioneers, uh, they made mistakes and were human. As I learned more about that, there were dark periods like the one I just mentioned at the cottage. But that just went into making me a better martial artist and a better writer. And I'm hoping it created a better book because you could see how these men, and they're pretty well men, first waves, not women, you could see how they struggled themselves and how they were trying to turn an old martial art to a modern one and, and make it popular. And they succeeded by and large, right? I mean, Taekwondo is one of the most popular martial arts in the world. I did turn to other instructors who I now look up to, but in a different way. People like Grandmaster C.K. Choi, who lives in Vancouver and British Columbia in Canada. He, for me, still now epitomizes a lot of what went right with my martial art, Taekwondo. He faced the the gangsters, he faced the Korean CIA officials, he faced potential corruption and, and so on, not just financially, but, but morally. And he came out on top, I think, in terms of a man who now tens of thousands, maybe 50,000 more people look up to. He, athletically too, I mean, he was a really incredible martial artist, a world champion. I think the first 
the first Taekwondo champion in the world in the early 60s. Uh, it was, the competition was in Korea. But he managed to maintain over many decades, from the early 60s to now, an integrity physically in the training and how he teaches instructors now. And then also morally in terms of his messages and how to live your life. He's a very humble guy. Um, and he ended up deserving an entire chapter in this new book that I put out. Um, he's, in, he's in the end there to show really how it's done. And I could tell you an anecdote later about him to, to sure. illustrate that. Okay. Okay. So clearly martial arts is a, a core thread through your life. I mean, you've been training for decades and yeah. it's become such an important part of you that, you know, you put in, I, I, I don't even want to speculate how much time in the research to make this book happen. But imagine some alternate reality where you never started training in Taekwondo. You never found martial arts at all. What do you think your life would look like now? That would be more boring. <laughs> <laughs> I have fewer friends. Okay. That's for sure. Um, I, I think I would just be overall less able, less flexible, less powerful, less aware of myself and my surroundings, less aware of relationships. Um, I come from a particularly violent background, from a very rough part of the city. And the martial arts helped me to come to terms with a lot of violence I saw on a daily basis, heard about, um, and experienced. So I, I would be a very different person if I didn't have Taekwondo. I did a bit of karate and, and Tai Chi as well, um, and a couple of different styles of Taekwondo. And they all, you know, it all boils down to just throwing your limbs in all directions in the gym or in a park somewhere. And then how hard you do that with the people you train with. In particular, the, the friends I train with every Saturday, all advanced black belts and all very decent people. Um, we've been training together for decades. And we all, we all agree that this cliche, it's a way of life, applies to all of us easily. And we would be diminished people. We'd be less than what we are if we weren't doing martial arts. Okay. okay. So, so I want to go back a little bit because you mentioned something about that, the violence that you were exposed to when you were younger in the city. Was that at all some of the impetus of you finding martial arts? Oh, yeah. Okay. I, um, when I was a skinny teenager, my mom just told me, you've got to study something. My mother and uncle told me, you've got to train, you've got to do something um, to strengthen your body. And this is, I mean, this is a story you probably heard dozens of times. And it's, it's actually uncanny the number of martial artists I've interviewed for my book who said, who said they were bullied, especially Koreans, older Koreans, who lived under Japanese, the Japanese occupation up until 1945. Um, but then anyway, even outside of that situation, the numbers of people who were bullied and uh, come from violent situations. They use martial arts to empower themselves physically, emotionally, psychologically. Some get into the spirituality of it as well. So I'd like you to think about a time in your life where things weren't going so great, you know, whatever that would be, and how your martial arts training helped you overcome or move past, however you want to look at that. And tell us about it. Well, I've, I've been through a divorce and uh, a couple of other tough times, a terrible illness with a family member. And in both cases, I remember feeling, um, I mean, if you've ever been in a traumatic situation that's long term, you, you know that feeling of numbness or heaviness when you're trying to just get your day going. I remember just getting my sorry ass down to a little gym. Sometimes I just stay in my living room and start 
light stretching. And on the way, as I built up to calisthenics and just throwing my legs around, my arms around, you know, as you're training, you think of things. You med- So there's a meditation in the movements, right? And I remember in particular yeah. going to the same spot day after day after day. And sometimes I'd miss a few days. But always with this feeling of boredom and I can't do this. Why am I in this space moving around? What is the point of training? This is this is a sport for children, you know, and so on. And of course, you know, if you're if you're in a down state, in a horrible situation, this is naturally what happens to your mind, right? And and your heart. But I remember over time, over months, and then eventually years, realizing. Oh my God, the, the physical movements are manifesting in different emotional states, in different psychological states, and I'm actually getting better. I mean, besides the obvious physiological facts that when you move, you're burning certain stress hormones, you're generating other certain happy hormones, you know, just being physically active always helps you with, with, with down emotional states, right? Mm-hmm. So I remember that really having a a mind-blowing experience one day, just realizing that the daily meditation through movement just had helped me immeasurably. I couldn't even measure how, how I would have been or what I would have been if I hadn't been training so regularly. Doing what I thought for so long was just boring. I mean, obviously in the end it wasn't boring. It was, it was life-giving. Yeah. Yeah, it did. The meditative aspects. I think a lot of people in the martial arts underestimate how meditative all aspects of what we do can be. When we think about meditation, we think about slow and and boring and fixed positions. But exactly, it it is it, it's more than that. You know, it's sparring can be meditative. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's all in your mindset. Yeah, I mean, it's some. Um if you just can turn off your mind and let let your body move you know I, I've done taekwondo patterns where I don't think I've done patterns where I don't even remember the movements I just let body instinct take over and and you know the body has its own memory in those in those states which aren't they're not highfalutin mystical mumbo jumbo states you just Naturally relax and things will start popping into your head and all of a sudden you realize your unconscious will present a solution to a problem you thought was unsolvable. Like, oh yes, that's that's what I'll do. That's the solution. So mm-hmm. yeah, there's some good stuff that comes out of out of training and, and just slowing the mind down, but not necessarily slowing the body down. Right. Now of course through the book and, and through your training in general, I'm sure you've been exposed to a ton of wonderful martial artists. But if we were to take out your, you know, the core people that you would refer to as your instructors, who would you tell us was the most influential in your martial arts career? That's a good question. Um, I'd have to say my instructors. I mean, uh, my instructor, Lenny DeVecchia, he was my instructor until about two years ago. Hugely influential. Um, you're with these men and women two, three, four, five times a week, you know, if you're training like that. And no matter what they do or say, you start sort of absorbing pretty much everything they're saying and not saying. I mean, the other one I mentioned already, Grandmaster C.K. Choi, his name's Chang Kun Choi. He was really, he's a great storyteller too. He, I don't know how to explain it, but I was at a tournament, I guess this is a good way of explaining it. I was at a tournament and he was the only master, grandmaster left at the end of the day, after a very long day, to be fair, who was still, and he's an older man, he was still wandering around the rings of the tournament, talking to participants, coaches, parents, happened to be there, giving them advice, to chatting. It was, a, it was remarkable, not just the amount of stamina he had, but so how much he cared about the nitty gritty. And he has a humble, calm way of talking. And I knew some of his history. I mean, another, another reason I admired him is he's just raw courageous. And he told me one anecdote, which ended up in my book, about buying a hotel in Vancouver on, 
in a neighborhood that was known for being extremely rough. One of his students was a police officer, and this person said to him, you know, don't, don't go into this neighborhood. Well, Choi bought a hotel. He bought a tavern. <laughs> and it was run by a man who was terrified of the clientele who were gangsters, basically, drug dealers. And Choi bought it um, for various reasons. I think he, at that point, had no choice and had to make some money. And, and um, he decided to clean it up. He opened the windows. He cleaned it up. And what, for 10 months, as he was trying to get this business going, restarted, getting quite a bit of attention from journalists, I think, who were watching. It's called the Sunrise Hotel. The, the, the gangsters and Riff Raff and others who were just hanging out began challenging him to fights. And he told me over a 10-month period, he fought pretty well every week. And usually there's just be one blow. And he'd always ask his tormentors, like, do you really want to do this? You know, we don't have to do this. It's almost like a movie scene. Mm. Except he, he didn't embellish. He just said, well, I hit the guy and he fell. And then his friends would say, Anyone who saw would say, this happened once. He said, what did you just do to him? What did you hit him with? He said, my fist. And, and then he'd try to always reconcile. Because he's soft-spoken, he wears glasses, and he's quite humble at just any old time. People end up trusting him and believing him. And he, because he was always fair, he wanted to run an establishment, and he didn't mind who hung out there. But he didn't want fighting and drug dealing and uh, extremely improper behavior, you know. He told me this story, and I found it fascinating because he, it was yet again a story from him showing how he stood up to people who had failed in their lives or were particularly violent, had not controlled the, the horrible violence in their lives and the criminality. They were actually leaders in that. He stood up to them, and he, he still tried to look at the good side of them, you know. And run a, mm -hmm. run a business and still allow them to hang out in his establishment. Um, it was a metaphor for me, I guess, or a symbol of Taekwondo and the martial arts globally. There's just so many stories of people who fight. There are so many movie scenes, you know, you see these sorts of things. And they're, they're pretty well cliched now, but you rarely hear about how this, this one person does stand up to folks and, and, um, uh, does I guess does the good thing and, and in a way remains friends with some of them. He told me about that as well. And mm -hmm. remained a leader in his Taekwondo community. That's pretty exceptional and certainly sounds like the type of person any of us would want to model ourselves after. And the, that, that humility, uh, you know, I think it's so rare that you get to hear the incredible stories of someone who is so humble, right? Because those that have a lot of humility don't usually talk about their exploits. It takes someone else to talk about them. That's a good way of putting it. He, he w is not, and at that time was not associated with any international group or even national association. And he had been offered money and position and so on, including from, uh, uh, gangsters, Korean CIA officials, South Korean politicians to be part of groups. And he wouldn't get involved if he found that there were serious ethical problems with these groups. Um, and it's hard for me to explain because he, you see, being Korean and new to Canada, he faced certain kinds of racism. He, because he had to make a living, there was that pressure. Mm. You know, there's a lot that's hard to explain even for hard for me to understand, but I, I consider him an exceptional person that he used his martial arts background and his particular superhero powers, you know, in various ways to better his life and really continue bettering it for tens of thousands of people over the decades. Wow. So let's talk about competition. That's come up a little bit here. And I always find it interesting to know what role competition has played with our guests. Were you, are you a competitor? No, I was never big into competitions. I was never, um, I went to a few and realized I was no good at it. To be blunt, <laughs> okay. to be blunt, I didn't have the, the physical gifts. 
and that's some of that raw aggression that you need in sparring to win. I like watching the finals of certain... I've been to many competitions because with the book I traveled quite a bit, the first edition of the book. Um, but generally, uh, I'm not fond of competitions. I'm not fond of uh, UFC, MMA, cage fighting. I will watch it, though, I have to admit. And I guess I should, I guess I should confess that I do watch a lot of this stuff, and I'm torn. There's a paradox there between watching um, mimicked violence or, you know, what looks like almost real fighting, and then being revolted by it at the same time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, think it, I think it almost speaks to two separate parts of our humanity. I think, you know, we can all agree and understand that we haven't evolved away from the need from violence very long ago. I mean, in, in terms of our time on this planet, yeah, it, it's been, you know, it's, it's been a blink. So we've got, but then, you know, we each have our individual minds that we're able to form and, and hone in on what's important in our, develop our own system of values. And yeah, I think, I think there's something physiologically at odds there for a lot of us. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about who you could have trained with. If you had the opportunity to train with, with anyone, be they alive or dead, who do you think you would have wanted to spend some time around? You know what? I was going to say Bruce Lee, but that's, that's just ridiculous. The, the men I trained with, the instructors, trained with Bruce Lee, and they told me, they told me that um, Bruce Lee learned from them. And I'm going to mention not just C.K. Choi, who I just mentioned, but also a man named Nam Tahi, N-A-M, Nam. He was part of the first wave and was of Taekwondo and helped create Taekwondo. He was an astounding athlete. And there's a third man named Park Jung Soo. I would have wanted to train with them in their heyday. Um, I would have wanted to be with them when they were younger. And you know, their legs, their multiple kicks moved like machine gun fire. And they were able to jump. People like Jun Ri as well were able to jump and kick things nine, ten feet in the air. They trained every day consistently. I mean, there's an amazing story they told me, which I think is true. I heard so many versions of this story that I think is true. Bruce Lee met some Taekwondo pioneers, at least one. I don't think it was only Jun Ri who he trained with and learned from as well. They learned from each other. But he ended up um, not being able to keep up just simply with the speed. I mean, if, you, if you've if seen some of these, I guess even if you've seen some of the world champions now, and people in that league, the, the speed at which they move and the power that they demonstrate is just mind-blowing. So I would have wanted to train with the first wave of, of Koreans and probably would not have been able to keep up whatsoever. <laughs> but it would have been nice just to be in that milieu and that very hardcore um, military um, environment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I probably would have been hospitalized after that. <laughs> and then gone back to my regular life. Right. Right. Maybe, maybe without full use of your legs. Right. right. Something like that. Yeah. So let's talk about movies. Are you much of a martial arts movie guy? A little bit, yeah. yeah. Any, any favorites? Well, it's funny you should ask. Like, I, I just watched, I just finished watching two seasons of Daredevil. Mm. Uh, Netflix's Marvel Daredevil, which, so it, which is good. And uh, that's, so that's my, I interviewed um, the main stuntman, uh, the stunt double for Daredevil for a story I wrote about him. Profile. Oh, oh, cool. And grew to really admire these unsung heroes. A lot of these, uh, well, almost all the martial arts techniques you see in movies are by martial arts stuntmen and stuntwomen. You know, Electra, who's in Daredevil, has a stunt double, and she's phenomenal. And um, I like the style of the movie. It's, it's a new kind of martial arts movie or even superhero movie, but a lot of 
non-superhero movies are using the style of fighting, which is more realistic looking and way more acrobatic, you know, the double, triple, quadruple kicks in the air and with or without ropes, you know. Right. Um, yeah, it's quite spectacular to watch and it's a new way of movie making. I, th- I think as more people have some martial arts experience, we've been able to pick up on things that were, you know, maybe not quite authentic. And so it forces that envelope to get pushed a little bit further, a little further. And then you get people that come in like Tony Ja, who, yeah. you know, you, you look at his, his actions and it's almost unbelievable that someone possesses that much physical talent. Yeah. You, know, you would swear it's computer graphics or something. Yeah. And it's not. So, you know, now, now the bar has been raised and everybody tries to keep up and we keep moving forward and forward in that way. Well, the only way we're, they're keeping up down movies with each other and competing is by ac- a- adding tricks, adding acrobatics, and then adding the special effect, the computer graphics on top of that. But the interesting thing about Daredevil and a couple other movies is that the superheroes, the heroes are getting beaten up now, which you didn't see much of, right, to be honest. Yeah. Um, The Raid, for example, Redemption, I guess it was called. Like Mm -hmm. these, the heroes take a pummeling. And so as a typical viewer, you, you can relate more because these people are human, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I think it makes it that much more impressive when they come out the other side. And of course, you know, I don't think we're going to give anything away for anyone that hasn't seen the daredevil show. And if you haven't uh, sign up for Netflix for a month and chew through the two seasons, because it's not just some of the best martial arts programming I've seen, but it's one of the best shows I've ever seen. I mean, it just, the, the acting is tremendous and, and the emotion that these characters are able to bring to the storyline are fa- fantastic. Uh, I've been a Vincent D'Onofrio fan who plays Kingpin yeah. uh, for for a long time, and he he's the perfect actor for that role. Yeah. But you see Daredevil get the tar beat out of him yeah. almost every episode, and he keeps finding a way to come back for more to, you know, if we want to borrow a tenant from Taekwondo, to persevere. Yeah, yeah. And the, 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 thematically what that means is the... The, the directors, the, the people who made the, the the series, can show the sadistic side of Daredevil. Like he re, he himself, the superhero, likes to pummel the bad guys. You know, and it's difficult to watch that. He keeps punching. You know, similar to a ground and pound in the, in a cage, he likes pounding people into, into the ground. And so, I mean, thematically, it's pretty complicated as a series, and I like that. You know, it's not just a unidimensional boring superhero movie by the way i like superhero movies too so i shouldn't (laughs) this no not at all not at all man movie was pretty good yeah yeah without a doubt how about martial arts movie actors is there anybody that stands out for you you know i have to mention uh the stunt men and stunt women um chris brewster who's the stunt double for daredevil i spoke to him on the phone and Watched a lot of his stuff from Captain America, Daredevil, and like 150 other movies. And, I mean, this guy can, like, physically, he's remarkable. He can jump over a standing person, just leapfrog, or he can jump over the person flipping in midair. And, obviously, he trains a lot. He trains every day in various styles, doing various things. Um... So he and some of some of this new wave of stuntmen women in California right now, Hollywood, are really impressive. And currently they're my favorites. Um, yeah. They're definitely unsung heroes. I mean, you, you do get some people that develop some skill either for a role or for their career. Um, you know, we've talked about Jason Statham on the show quite a bit, who yeah, yeah. despite not having a lot of what we would call traditional martial arts background, you watch any of his movies and he pulls it off very, very well. You know, he does have some, certainly has physical gifts there. Um, yeah, he's like Charlie, and, Co- sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Please go ahead. Well, he's like Charlie Cox who plays Daredevil. 
in that series. Uh, Charlie Cox is not a martial artist. He's not a boxer, but he's a great mimic. So these actors are great mimics. And their stunt doubles work with them very closely. You know, if during a fight the superhero is dropping his, his non-punching hand, then the stunt double will say, as Chris Brewster told me, he said, no, you got to raise that hand, you're dropping it. But, you know, they're great athletes too, those actors. They're, they're astounding athletes. Yeah. Yeah, and we've talked about some of the other stunt people that have been involved in some of the movies. You know, when we do a movie profile, you and I were talking before the recording that you would listen to the Billy Jack episode we did. Yeah. And, you know, of course, um, I forget the gentleman's name now, but, but the Hapkido instructor that trained Tom Laughlin had to step in, you know, in that famous scene, the, the foot to the face scene. Yeah. And, We've talked about Fumio Demura and his involvement in the original Karate Kid movie. And, you know, it's interesting that some of these stunt people that are, you know, I think so often today seen as just kind of background, you know, clearly a very important element to the movie. But earlier in martial arts films, they were not only martial artists, but martial artists that people knew. And how much fun would that be now if we had more of that? You know, the, the martial artists have learned how to act and become actors first and foremost and martial artists second. I mean, we're seeing almost, I think, a, um, a, a, a rollback in a way. You get people like, like Donnie Yen and Daniel Wu yeah. who are just exceptional martial artists who also happen to be actors. Yeah, which is rare. Let's face it. To, to have the physical talent as well as uh, the wherewithal to, to show it on screen. You know, like a lot of them have to slow down their techniques because they move too quickly, <laughs> right? But then also just to, to plain act. That's, that's a whole skill set right there. And then there's the relations on screen. A lot of martial artists have egos. I'm sorry to say, but it, they're extremely difficult to work with. Um... And I'm talking about the older men, really. And uh, so if, if you have that kind of talent, usually you got the ego to go with it or some kind of massive insecurity. That's what I found anyway with my Taekwondo interviews. And so, yeah, for them to actually work with others and pull off a great scene, that, that requires a whole other skill, skill set as well. Sure. sure. And you're not bringing up anything that we haven't talked about on the show. There's, yes, exactly. there's certainly a lot of ego that rolls through our world. Right. So let's talk about books. And, you know, I want to spend some time talking about A Killing Art. But before we jump into that, because that's going to be, you know, I'm sure we're going to wander a bit with that. Are there any other martial arts books that you're particularly fond of? There's a thin one called uh, The Tin Flute. I haven't looked at it in a while. I think that's what it's called. Um, I'm looking at my shelf right now. There's that four or 500-year-old one by Mushashi. Mm. He's one way of pronouncing his name. Um, I read that one. A lot of businesses use that now. But essentially, those. I read more comic books than martial arts books, <laughs> to be <laughs> honest. Uh, but we're kind of a graphic novel right now. So oh, into cool. comic books, yeah. I don't read a lot of old. Martial arts books that aren't uh, heavily corroborated, or because there's so many stories, right? Yeah, yeah. Now I've heard you, I think, mention a couple times. You're a journalist. Is that by trade? Yeah, by trade. Okay, so you know that your uh, BS meter probably goes off a little bit sooner than for a lot of us. My spidey sense. Yeah, probably makes it hard to read some of those books when, when you know the legends have been skewed. A bit as they were passed down. Yeah, that's a good word. Legends. All right, so let's let's talk about a killing art. Why? I think that's the the first the first question. Because I'm sure you knew going in it was going to be quite the undertaking, or or did you? I mean, am I am I putting words in your mouth? Well, writing a book is an undertaking. Yeah, 
It's like a big fat relationship. Why write about Taekwondo? Um, you know, well, imagine, put yourself in my situation. I was a black belt, a new black belt, and I suddenly started hearing from an instructor these astounding tales. They were astounding. That the man who started Taekwondo, which I thought was a thousand-year-old martial art, he actually lived in Toronto, the city I lived in. Um, the, the man who ran my gym, the dojang, was his, used to be his right-hand man and apparently had tried to kidnap and kill him. Uh, the Korean CIA and Korean gangsters had started Olympic Taekwondo and had they had got Taekwondo in the Olympics, apparently. I heard these stories as a young black belt and thought, they can't be true. I mean, I guess as a journalist, I wanted to find out if they were true. And then when I found out some of them were true, I thought, I have to write about this. I mean, there's a lot of, there were a lot of things online, on the internet. People gossiped a lot. And as I got into the research, first of all, for some magazine articles, because that's how the book started, a couple of magazine pieces, I realized um, even the grandmasters and masters didn't know the whole story of their own martial art. So like a good journalist, I thought, oh, yeah, I'll write something that everyone would want to read. And so it was a seven-year project off and on. As I like to joke, a killing art almost killed me. The amount of effort I put into it, the amount of work that went into it. But I think now a lot of people, I still get about a letter a week, a le yeah, a letter a week on Facebook by email from a reader with over-the-top praise. It's been eight, nine years now. The book's been out. So there's definitely readership out there. They tend to be the people who are training and don't know much about the history or black belts or middle management in organizations or people running dozens of gyms or even just three and they suddenly find out more about the history and it deepens their own training the awareness of themselves and their relationships with those in the martial art the business side of it which is always for some reason murky and uh, odd you know mm. um just the kickbacks alone are bizarre so i think people learn a lot from reading a killing art in general have you experienced much much pushback or um, anger among some of the, the older set? You know, I expected way more. I, I, I expected more people to be in my face, but I can only remember one person, an American, challenging me online. And even then, not directly. It was on some forum. And he used his real name. And almost all the criticism little there was was anonymous um i mean i didn't go looking for maybe there's a mountain of criticism there but most of it was anonymous and i didn't pay it any mind if it was anonymous because usually the criticisms weren't based on anything i wrote in the book anyway so sort of what they mm -hmm. thought was in the book the main the main criticism of me and my book was how dare you how dare you write about this book who are you to write about taekwondo who are you to write about these great men and these great pioneers, you know, dead or alive? That was that kind of attitude. You know, as a journalist, when you hear criticism like that, you just get happy because you, <laughs> you know you're onto something, right? People right. can't address the content of the questions, stuff you're raising, and instead start attacking you personally, then you know you're onto something, right? Did you set out to write the kind of behind the scenes tell all that this became? I did, yeah. Or, yeah. Okay. That was the purpose. I wanted from the start, the purpose was to show both why I loved Taekwondo, why everyone that does it loves it, and then the darker sides as well. I wanted to I wanted to show that how should I put this? I want to show that it was a killing art. It was an art developed in the military, practiced by police officers, soldiers, spies, uh, gangsters, street fighters. And then from there, it quickly jumped into civilian gyms. And so initially in the 50s and 60s, it was a brutal martial art. They took bits and pieces of other martial arts, mainly karate, and they put it together a Korean version of karate. And 
added a whole bunch of jumping and athleticism and breaking techniques. They Koreanized it. And it was hardcore. And they used it in the Vietnam War. I mean, they, the Koreans sent hundreds of thousands of soldiers to Vietnam. And they also sent hundreds of black belts to train Vietnamese and American and other soldiers because of the, the hand-to-hand uh, and, and jungle combat and so on. And so the martial art got created in this, this, these hardcore, horrible situations on the street, in the jungles. And I wanted to go back to some of those scenarios and to show people, okay, first of all, Taekwondo is not what you're seeing on television in the Olympics, people bouncing around and just doing these light kicks. Um, Interestingly, by the way, as a digression, many of those martial artists in Olympics are astounding martial artists in other martial arts as well. (laughs) They're just... Doing the martial arts, they're supposed to be doing the Olympics, but they're capable of much more as well. So one purpose of the book, just to get back to the point, is to show the darker history in terms of the movements, the development, how it started. And then the men, the small group of geniuses and animals, the barroom brawlers, the generals, who created it to show what they were. They were bullied and they were bullies. They led hundreds of thousands of men and some of them didn't lead anybody. They were drinkers and playboys and they went to whorehouses and geisha houses and you know it was a work hard play hard um i guess culture for some of these men and i want to show how the martial art also came from them right it wasn't now what we're seeing usually which is doing martial arts mainly with kids in, in malls and shop you know above shops and basements and it wasn't full of spiritual mumbo jumbo about improving your soul and, and your heart and all this ancient stuff taken from, I don't know what ancient Chinese manuals. It was um, created by guys who wanted to fight and defend themselves and defend their nation and empower their nation. It was very clear. There was a very clear um, goal from, from the start with Taekwondo. I think as there was with karate decades before in Japan. So I wanted to show that, the empowerment, both the darker and the lighter sides of it, and how, that, how the empowerment in the history and the people still now is in the movements, the techniques, and that, that, that our history would empower us now as we're training now. So there was, and there was an, I had an overall goal for the whole book, I guess a theme it's around empowerment. Was there ever a point in your research where you talked to someone or you bumped into a story that made you want to stop? Did you uncover anything? I mean, and if it's something that's not in the book, or, or even if it is, you know, you don't you don't have to say what it was. But there are some there's some things that you uncovered that were god awful. I mean, I don't know another way to put it. But was there anything that made you so upset that you considered stopping? I never considered stopping except once, uh, really, maybe twice. And I told you about that. And I ended up in, mm. a, in, a week, in a cottage for a week. And that was mainly because of, uh, honestly, just terror of how much more crap I would find and terror at what some of the reactions would be when people read what I wrote. So I had to be careful. I had to, I decided what to include in the book and what not to. The second time I, th- I think I considered certainly putting the book on ice when I began, because I'm an investigative journalist, I'm good at finding out things. And I started discovering things with family dynamics among some of the main players. And some of them, some of the scenes were just revolting. And I, I couldn't write about them. They weren't directly relevant to the book, but but they were. You know, when a martial artist practices his martial art on family members, mm. you know, full on, it, it turns your stomach. And it, there's that could go that could have gone in the book, right, to show what kind of man that person was. But I drew a line there at one point and said, "No, I'm not going to put that in. I'm not going to get into it." I, I alluded to it in a few parts of the book, 
alluded to a couple of things that I found. I thought the whole project here is to get the book done and to give people a glimpse of the real history of Taekwondo, the truth. It's not to get into the nitty gritty of family abuse. Right. So yeah, I kept going. Okay. So I'm glad you did. Thanks. <laughs> So you've mentioned that there's a second edition coming out. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's out in August this year, and um, I've revised, I've updated pretty every page, every chapter, and I've added new sections, including um, a fun little bit of Taekwondo in Russia in the early 90s during a coup d'etat. I had a chapter about um, this this. Uh, I, I consider a great man, Choi, in, in Vancouver, BC. Um, and then I updated everything else, sort of in terms of recent trends in Taekwondo, in terms of transparency, money, power dynamics, mergers. The, the leaders of Taekwondo are always talking about merging the various factions and coming to terms with their ugly past histories. So I update that as well. So for those of us that have read it, it's worth reading again because there's that much more new stuff, it sounds like. I think it's worth reading again, yeah. yeah. I mean, most readers that contact me say they've read it two, three times anyway. There's a lot in there. There's a lot I mean, I certainly, yeah. I, I certainly felt that as I finished it up to say I could, I could use this. I could read this again, certainly, and it's, it's kind of back in the list on my Kindle to chew through again, but I think I'll wait for that second edition. However, the, the, I mean, you yourself know so much about martial arts, you probably don't need to read this revised version. I, the main reader for this book was a younger generation, people who haven't read the book, who don't know much about, I mean, most people don't even know who created Taekwondo and who named it. Most martial artists doing Taekwondo don't know that. This is basics like that or, or, or where it's from. So I wrote it mainly for them. And for people that haven't read the book or, you know, have missed the episodes where we've talked about it, if you had to, if I asked you to sum up the book in just a couple sentences, how would you, how would you describe it? I rewrote the book so that anyone who doesn't do martial art would love it as well. It, it's lighter to read now. It reads like a spy novel and it opens up. In 1938, Korea, during a poker game that goes horribly wrong. And we follow this man as he starts creating Taekwondo and then meets the nemesis of his life. And the two of them just have a go at each other for pretty well the whole book, as they both are turning Taekwondo into the one of the hottest martial arts in the world. So it's a, it's a rollicking good read. <laughs> I, anyone that's listened to the show has probably heard me recommend it. So definitely it should be on your reading list. Um, there are some rather dry martial arts books out there. This is not one of them. Um, I rarely endorse things on the show, but you know, um, just having you on the show hopefully is seen as an endorsement to the listeners. And, and so I'll just be that explicit and say, if you haven't read a killing art, you really should. Uh, and now's your opportunity to tell people where they can get it. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. It's available. It will be available in August at pretty well every bookstore and online as well, anywhere in North America, and then pretty well every other part of the world, I think, at this point. Cool. So if anyone wants to reach you, email you, or something like that. Maybe they've got some feedback. They want to tell you they love the book or um, they want to send you some, some hate mail uh, with their name, you know, not anonymous, of course. Uh, how would someone reach you? Yeah, that's the best hate mail. Yeah, at killingart.com. Please email me. Great. And, of course, we'll link that in the show notes as well as links to the other things that we've talked about today. So... Head on over there, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, if you're new to the show. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks for the opportunity. I, it's a great show. Absolutely. Appreciate you being here. And any parting words of wisdom for the people listening? 
Uh, yeah, laugh at yourself. Thank you for listening to episode 106 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Mr. Gillis. Over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, you can find links to Mr. Gillis' website, as well as places to buy the book. If you know someone that would be a great interview for the show, please fill out the form at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, or if you want to shoot us a message with a suggestion for a Thursday show or some other feedback, there's a place to do that, too. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram, and our username is always Whistlekick. If you like the show, please be sure you're subscribing or using one of our free apps. They're available on both iOS and Android. For those of you kind enough to leave us a review, remember, we check out the different podcast review sites, and if we find your review mentioned on the air, be sure to email us for your free pack of Whistlekick stuff, including a t-shirt and other great things. And remember the products you can find at Whistlekick.com or on Amazon like our hats and our sparring gear. If you're a school owner or team coach, you should check out wholesale.whistlekick.com for our discounted wholesale program. We'll be back soon, but until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.